Welcome to our Romans Bible study, and this week we're carrying on from chapter 12. Um, we skipped chapters 1 to 4, but just in summary, 1 to 4 was talking about the fact that everybody has sinned, both Jews and Gentiles, and a reminder that, that we've all fallen short. Then Romans chapter 5, where we got to next, is about how God saves. So if Romans chapters 1 through 4 outline the problem of sin and God's t solution to that problem, the gift of Jesus Christ, but this solution raises some questions, some objections. How does it work? And, and also, is it possible? And how it works in chapter 5 verse 1 to 11 points out that God's love is made known in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit testifies to this love by pouring it into our hearts. Verses 12 to 21 point out by comparison how much more Christ's obedience can bring redemption to the world than Adam's disobedience, saying that Adam was just a human like anybody of us and his disobedience resulted in such a terrible consequence for all the world. How much more can Christ's obedience make a change in the world for the better? And then chapters 6 through 7 help us to understand sanctification. The process of how we are made holy, how we are made uh, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. A reminder that we are, in a sense, under new management as we belong to new uh, to God completely. But what about the law is the question that many would answer then. And in chapters 9 to 11, Paul answers the other objection, what about Israel? So the objection, what about the law, asks, is the law sin? Chapter 7, verse 7 to 25. And the law is not sin. It points, helps us to see what uh, we've done wrong and where we've messed up and how the problem is deeper than just on the surface, but something about our conscience and our heart too. And the solution to that to that ineffective way of changing our lives is life in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. These amazing and, and hopeful um, words to us about how life can be changed. So Paul dealt with the objection about the law and that we needn't live by the law. But there was still a community of Jews and Gentile Christians who were trying to work out how to get along. And the Jewish Christians wanted the Gentile Christians to keep the laws that, that Jewish Christians, Jews, would normally keep. The law about circumcision, about Sabbath keeping, and about dietary observance. And so Paul has to really drive home the fact that the law doesn't apply in the way that it does. The Spirit rather sets us free from all of these obligations. And uh, we can be reminded of how the leaders in Acts wrote to the Gentile churches that Paul was missioning to in Acts chapter 15, verse 28 to 29, where they said, it, is, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So in chapters 9 to 11, Paul is, is not just asking what about the Jews, but can Jews be Christian? And what he argues against is the idea that you can be Jewish by descent and merely by descent. Paul leans toward faith. And he's pointed out already that Abraham becomes the father of the Jews, the, the great ancestor, because of faith, not because of any legal obligation. And he reminds us that the Jewish people are children of the promise. And those who live by the promise put their trust in God's faithfulness and so live according to God's call and God's laws. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we read, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. And, and we read that to remind us about how we can come into relationship with, with Jesus Christ as Gentiles. But in the context that Paul was writing in Romans chapter 9 through to 11, 
he was speaking about the Jews of his day and how they could also come to faith in God through Jesus Christ. And in a sense, for him, I think he was saying that they could then be be properly Jewish because for him, uh, Jesus was the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures in the Old Testament and and was the only only way. And in this instance, which we apply to all people, and rightly so, Paul is actually speaking about the Jews who chose to believe and trust in Jesus. And he reminds us of, of words from Isaiah chapter 65 in Romans 10 verse 20. I've been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. He points out Isaiah's frustration with the Jewish people who do not hear what God is saying and who effectively reject, reject God and are able to choose God or, or, or reject God. And so Paul reminds us that you don't just become uh, a, a Jew by right of birth, but rather it is something that you become because of faith. And the promise that he makes is that more are included, and that's not a bad thing. So the Jewish people are not rejected, but rather they can choose to, inc to be included or exclude themselves, and more can choose to join. It's not an exclusive uh, something to which you belong. At the end of Romans 9 through to 11, a beautiful little doxology uh, closes it off. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So as Paul comes to, to the end of Romans 9 through to 11, he reminds us to be humbled before God. He presents a doxology about God's wisdom, drawing on Isaiah 40, verse 13, and Job 41, verse 11. These quotations celebrate God's exalted status and wisdom over his creatures, and a reminder for us to all remain humble and allow God to make the rules about how we belong and how we can become part of his family. It's not for us to to assume his role as creator or judge because we don't have anything to offer God. We have nothing. And so in light of God's greatness, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And that'll bring us to Romans chapter 12 and the beginning of Romans chapter 12. So Romans chapter 12 through to 15 are essentially practical advice that respond to, to the theology that we've learned from Romans chapters 1 to 11. And this is often a way in which Paul writes. He often writes in ways that expound his doctrine and then talks about the practical implications. We've revised it already, but the beginning of the message was that all have sinned. Second, that God offered a graceful solution in, in Jesus Christ. And this is a solution not just for Jews, but for Gentiles too. And a reminder that salvation is not by observance of the law but through faith. Faith in who God has shown himself to be, a God who is gracious and compassionate. We're reminded of, of Abraham's faith from Romans chapter 4, verse 18, where Abraham hoped against hope, for he believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. The thing that made Abraham belong was his trust in the goodness in the good nature of God. And so we are invited also to respond in faith to what God has done. In chapter 12, Paul continues, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So there's much symbolism going on here. The bodies being offered might be bodies offered in baptism, as symbolically the Christian goes into the water to die and comes out the other side alive again in a different kind of existence. But also the simple everyday sacrifice of oneself as we say, God, I belong to you and not to myself. The Greek word for bodies, soma, is a word that refers to the entire person. 
the wholeness of the person, not just um, not just the physical body, but but everything that the person does and everything that the person does to sustain themselves. And so it's not foolish to go to the grocery shop and pray about what you would buy to make your decisions day by day, guided by God's love and grace and not in your own power, but saying, Lord, I belong to you today. What I'm doing belongs to you. I do this for you and to glorify you. We're invited not just to offer our bodies, but to offer them as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice of all that we are, an expression that indicates that believers are to continually offer themselves in service to God. So not just that once off, now you belong to Christianity because you were baptized or because you fulfilled this ritual, or that once off, now you belong to the family of Israel because you were born that way, but rather every day to intentionally offer yourself as a living sacrifice. It also reminds us again of baptism and what Paul is writing in Romans chapter 4 verse 10 to 11. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Eugene Peterson's translation also helps us to understand what it means to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. A living sacrifice. A continuous and ongoing decision to live your life for God in everything you do. And so we are reminded again of what Abraham did when he offered himself as a living sacrifice. We're reminded of baptism. And uh, back to Romans chapter 6. How could we who died to to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. This is the what it means to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, to walk in newness of life, always mindful of the fact that we belong to God, that we are continually being transformed as we give ourselves to God. Paul goes on to say that this is a a spiritual act of worship. And the word for spiritual actually comes from logikos, which reminds us of logic, suggesting that worship that involves the heart and mind in contrast to physical offerings and sacrifices could be translated as reasonable or proper, indicating worship that reflects a correct understanding of the gospel message and a rational response to it. It also might mean true, implying that worship is appropriate for those with a renewed mind. So spiritual worship, and we're reminded of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, where he promises that God's worshippers will worship him in spirit and in truth does not just mean that there's some sort of uh, airy, fairy, uh, breathy kind of worship, but a reasonable and sound-minded worship that is a practical life offered to God. And this is also a reminder that that practical life offered to God is, 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 is the highest worship that we offer. I often like to say that our Sunday worship in church, as we miss it right now, is not the actual real deal worship. Real deal worship is Monday through Friday and Saturday. Sunday is like going to gym and having a workout and making yourself stronger and and readier for everything else that you will, will do in service of God. As you get your worship muscles right, as you warm yourself up to offer yourself more completely and more fully to God. This spiritual worship is worship of service. And this reminds us also that it's uh, the priestly duties in the temple. That we, as we offer ourselves as sacred beings who have been brought into God's kingdom, as citizens of God's kingdom, do not operate in a physical temple, but are ourselves God's temple. And we offer ourselves because God has made us a holy priesthood. And so we are sacred beings who are, who are invited to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in service of God. 
and towards a specific surface, which is, which is reconciliation and renewal, not just of ourselves, but of everything and everyone around us, as we invite others to belong to this same family. And so we continue to read what Paul writes in, chap- in verse 2 of chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And if we think about what's going on here, being conformed to the world in this Gentile and Jewish conflict in the church at Rome is about living the way of the world and seeing nationhood and race or culture as more important than belonging to one another in God. The world doesn't see ways in which we can be reconciled to one another. The world doesn't see ways in which Jews and Gentiles can worship together. The world demands something, uh, somebody give up their identity. But if we're not being conformed to the ways of the world, we're allowed to be ourselves. And each of us individually is to be transformed by the renewal of our minds as God renews and changes our minds so that we might discern what is the will of God. And so we don't ask, what do I want? What does the world want of me? We ask, what does God want of me? What is God's good and acceptable and perfect will? And we're reminded, too, of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. The will of God is to reconcile the world to himself, to bring us into that ministry of reconciliation. As we pass on the message that Paul has, has been at pain to to write out in chapters 1 through to 11. As we pass that message on to everybody we meet, all this from God, says Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 5, 18 to 19, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Often as Christians we think that it's our task to sit in judgment over everybody. And even the disciples, I remember, they asked if they could sit at Jesus' left and right. But Jesus reminded them that whoever is last in the kingdom will be first. And Paul will go on in, in uh, verses uh, f- 5 and etc. of this pass- part of, of Romans chapter 12 to remind us that we are to put ourselves last in order to be first in the body of Christ. So Paul goes on to remind us, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So imagine this community where Jews and Gentiles are pitted against one another, and the Jews are saying that the Gentiles don't belong because they don't keep the rules, and the Gentiles are saying that the Jews don't belong because they're not maybe spiritual enough, etc. And uh, rather, if they do not think of themselves more highly than they ought, they might learn something from one another and see the beauty of, of the others in their community, living according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. It reminds us that this body of Christians is one body. Whereas in one body we have many members, Not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. Remember those words from our communion service, in which we are are, are bound into a community together as we share in the bread and the wine. And we are bound in service to God with one another as we share in that meal. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. We're invited to to find these gifts in each of our being. Sometimes church is, is too much just one person talking all the time and not giving enough chances for everybody to say their piece and to do their part. Each of us has some gift to give. And the church will die if each of us doesn't use our gifts to prophesy, to speak into the situation of the moment and give God's word for now, to do ministry 
to heal and to serve, to teach and to instruct and help the next generation to know the, the good message of God, to encourage and exhort, to lift up, to give, to give in time and in resources, to lead, to be one of those people who is loud enough to say, let's go this way and let's go this way in a servantly kind of attitude and in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. I just love that kind of contrast. I always think of the compassionate as, as sad because of the brokenness of, of the world around them. But the compassionate, the truly compassionate, offers, offers themselves joyfully to serve and to lift up those who are struggling. Then next week we'll continue with the marks of the true Christian. As Paul continues, Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honour, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for these words from Romans that remind us of your will for us. Your will for us to be agents of reconciliation and healing and wholeness in the world in which we live. Help us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in response to all the gracious mercy that you have offered us. Help us in this difficult time to to live in faith, in true faith, offering ourselves daily to you, to use us according to your will. So be with us, be with those who struggle and suffer, and bring us at last to your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.